Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today we're talking about all things rapamycin. Yeah. So this is a, a relatively frequently requested topic. And I know in, pa- in the past, we've talked about mTOR inhibition. We've talked about protein. We've talked about leucine content, BCAAs. And lots of people ask us about different anti-aging interventions. So there's a couple different ways to look at anti-aging. You can look at cosmetic anti-aging. You can look at protein folding. You can look at DNA damage or a DNA telomere length. You can look at methylation patterns. You can look at oncogenes. But uh, in general, the, the two or three ways that I look at it is you can look at DNA aging, you can look at cosmetic aging, and you can look at um, function-related aging or health span-related aging. Yeah, because so, the other ones, they're sort of you know, buzzwords sometimes, but the functional endpoint we care about is, and probably the most commonly used term now is health span versus lifespan. Because mm-hmm. lifespan continues to go up, but not necessarily health span. Yeah. So... Rapamycin, for those who don't know, is kind of the OG mTOR inhibitor. Uh, The R in mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin. And I believe it was found in the dirt on Easter Island. I think it has a cool story like that. But anyway, the story probably doesn't matter that uh, much other than just being interesting. Um, But uh, mTOR is also activated at a high level in diets that are high in certain proteins, like BCAAs, particularly leucine. And it has to do with cell turnover. So if you think about cells turning over lots and lots, things like growth hormone, even though some people think growth hormone is anti-aging, growth hormone causes cells to turn over more and can increase tumor growth risk. And um, theoretically, people thought, well, look at rapamycin. Um, It could likely do that as well. It's on-label indication is um, for uh, organ transplants when you don't want to have rejection against the organ transplants. And there is a a host of clinical literature on mice. Uh, So if you want to go on a huge rabbit trail, I'd say there's probably weeks worth of reading on that. But there is is human trials um, off-label for rapamycin for uh, potentiating the effect to make uh, immunizations more effective in older individuals. There's also um, benefits to control cytokine storms and uh, hyperactive cytokine responses in other types of infections. But what we'll mostly focus on today is its effect on cell turnover, aging, and then also mood. Yeah. And like you pointed out, growth hormone, you know, IGF-1, insulin, it's another one you can throw in there. All those things are going to drive mTOR, which will help cells grow and adapt to a stressor. Uh, If exercise is a stressor, then having a short-term influx of those hormones, probably not a bad thing. But if you are in a chronically mTOR overactivated state, then we know that that is bad. And that's what a lot of these atypical cells and cancers are going to have is dysregulation in this mTOR signaling. So I guess if we go back to the beginning, like, you know, why are we looking at rapamycin? Why are people even taking this now? Because it's kind of ran the gamut of all the model organisms. So all the way from Mm -hmm. yeast to roundworms to mice, and now Uh, A couple of studies that have been done in uh, dogs. And then there's also one cat study that just came out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, those are kind of restricted to looking just at cardiac function, um, but not really any, you know, worrying safety concerns in those model organisms. So the mice, the cats, the dogs, um, when they're using these sort of protocols and dosing that they've outlined. Yeah. I don't have a lab rat at home, but I do have two Irish wolfhounds. And I suppose um, uh, I could flex a little bit and say, Before it was cool, I had my uh, Irish wolfhound on rapamycin. Some people are familiar with uh, Dr. Matt Caberlein. He's Mm -hmm. done a lot of podcasts, Dog Aging Project. I think he's with the University of Washington. Um, And uh, it's basically a program to put dogs on rapamycin that have high incidence of cancer. At some other time, I'll probably do a podcast with a vet and talk about high incidence of osteosarcoma and wolfhounds and Great Danes and other types of dog breeds. Um, A third of them get it. They have a bimodal life um, expectancy distribution. Um, my oldest wolfhound is about three years over his life expectancy. So I'm very happy with that. And, um, again, no need to go into that today. There's a lot of other (laughs) things that he's on as well for people who are interested, but we'll get into that in a different podcast. Yeah. And if I'm thinking about this and looking at the data, what do I think, you know, if rapamycin was a once weekly pill and it got an indication for something outside of its current indication, uh, I think the use there would be for preventing 
the cardiac complications of high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, you can probably do a similar thing by lowering someone's blood pressure with a medication because it's that pressure overload that's going to stress the organ and have an mTOR response and have enlargement of the organ to meet that need. And a lot of times that's maladaptive. So if you put someone in the general population, a lot of people do have high blood pressure, they're getting too much mTOR activation, and you put them on rapamycin, and this is why I think would actually be a better candidate drug in the TAME trial, mm -hmm. uh, which down another trail is metformin in adults, I believe 65 to 80, to see if it can delay some of these things, major adverse cardiovascular events, um, heart failure, I, I presume, is in there. It affects a significant number of people. Mm -hmm. But that's where I would kind of put the, the money at. I don't know that it would necessarily give someone an extra 10 years or 15 years of lifespan, but delaying heart failure um, 10 or 15 years would be substantial. That seems like a pretty good benefit, I guess, to play devil's advocate. Why would we take things like rapamycin or metformin? I've heard that metformin is an antiandrogen. Um, you want to take BCAs to build muscle, right? Is is it just they want us to be weak and small? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there's a there's a balance there, and I think there's actually a I don't know if I'll be able to dig up the reference, but looking at mice and putting them through you know strenuous exercise, high protein diet, or um, building up their aerobic capacity, you know, in the first half of their life. You actually want more of those growth factors around. And then when mice hit, you know, middle age, which is probably something like what, 400, 450 days for mm -hmm. your average mouse, maybe a little bit more, depending yeah. on how well they're cared for, which we'll talk about later. Yes, we will. But um, then at that point, excess of that mTOR signaling can become detrimental. So you probably see a similar phenomenon. You know, someone who's 20 years old, relatively healthy, you know, trying to be very even healthier, let's say, or like anti-aging, mm -hmm. taking rapamycin for them is probably not going to have a substantial effect compared to someone who is, you know, your average 60 or 70 year old. Mm -hmm. The analogy that I use for this is it's the investment account of your body composition. That's your IRA 401k. You want to work hard, invest as early as possible. Yes, even as a teenager in your early 20s, you're investing in that retirement account. You might not be enjoying it or looking forward to it, or maybe you are enjoying it. Um, but uh, even if you don't want to build up your bone mineral density, which really should be done during adolescence, after that, that retirement account, you, you're no longer qualified. You're, you can't donate into your Roth anymore. <laughs> You've already gone through your teenage years. After about early 20s, it's really hard to gain significant amounts of bone mineral density. Um, but uh, you can still build in the retirement account when you're, um, you know, 70 years old, like you mentioned, you probably don't want to be working three different jobs, 90 hours a week, you're probably going to burn out. There's a higher incidence of side effects from doing those things, excess growth factors, keeping your IGF-1 at 300. Um, so that's the way that we look at it. Yeah. Talking about some of the up and coming things. So this one that sort of caught my eye. It was a very simple study design. They're looking at delaying ovarian aging. I think this, again, goes back to some mice studies. And mice, I don't believe, go through a true menopause. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a similar phenomenon, but not exactly. But basically, they're going to give women uh, a one, once per week dose, five milligrams of rapamycin. And then they're going to measure the AMH levels and see if those are maybe increasing or declining more slowly compared to, I presume, a placebo group or a reference population, um, which will be interesting. I, I would be more interested in an individualized dosing protocol than sort of a set milligram dosing. Um, but again, that does make the study more expensive and more complicated and less likely to get funded, I would assume. Yeah. That being said, you could probably give mice PCOS and that would also um, increase their AMH. <laughs> <laughs> AMH, the lower it is, in, in general, the less eggs you have in your ovary, and the higher it is, the more eggs you have in your ovary. If you have PCOS, it does tend to run higher. Uh, more follicles, more AMH yeah. production. And that actually translates to a longer reproductive window. So mm -hmm. it's not just sort of an artifact of the syndrome. It's something that actually seems to extend reproduction. But mm -hmm. again, PCOS um, could be a challenge for someone's health span because insulin resistance does tend to go along with that. Yep. 
So uh, yeah, always hard to say what carries over how much between mice and humans. But that being said, as we'll discuss a bit more, it has a pretty reasonable safety profile from a uh, pretty high amount of human trials. As we mentioned, this is FDA approved on a different indication. And for an individual that um, needs to delay ovarian aging for whatever reason, it's something that they consider as part of the regimen. Yeah, absolutely. And while we're under this sort of umbrella of reproduction, um, this one was really interesting. I think what they did was they incubated these oocytes being used for like potential future in vitro fertilization with rapamycin. And the, the take home was that it suggested that the maturation rate was increased. So more oocytes making it to maturation, more viable mm -hmm. oocytes. Mm -hmm. um, and improve their developmental potential and reduce the accumulation of DNA damage. So DNA damage is another sort of hallmark of aging, you can call it. So I thought this was a really interesting study because it's actually, you know, you would think that you know, a cell's very first cell would not be overactivated, but then you go and look at the, I guess I could use the word host or the, the female in that picture. Yeah. Um, if that person has excess mTOR signaling, hmm. then it does seem kind of intuitive that these cells derived from that individual would also potentially have some excess mTOR signaling. Yeah. Perhaps could stack nicely for those on fertility protocols that include growth hormone or growth hormone releasing peptides. Because mm -hmm. it is pretty commonly used off label, not uh, necessarily like academic centers. Um, but HGH is certainly used in fertility protocols. So that could be some nice synergy. And then um, another thing uh, that I just thought of, perhaps it could be useful for males that have high amounts of DNA fragmentation. Because fragmentation, especially as age increases in the male, is a concern. It, you know, it can, if fragmentation is 50, 60%, that's um, a huge concern. Um, but that would be... I don't think there'd be any evidence for that, but it yeah, could be a benefit. I, I think there's some evidence to the counterpoint of that. I, I don't know if I put the citation in here, but under side effects, at least in mice, it's shown that mTORC1, uh, which is the preferential target mm -hmm. that rapamycin is going to hit, um, does seem to impede spermatogenesis, at least in some amount of rodents, some strains of mice. So you know, do we know if this is happening in humans? Not necessarily, but, you know, again, it probably depends on the baseline level of signaling. Yep. If you're just restoring a normal, then I think yeah, absolutely to your point that putting things back to a more optimal state would lead to a better quality of sperm being produced, just like we see a better quality of egg here. Yeah. Also, if you go from a count of 150 million to 120 million, but you have significantly less fragmentation, that would be... Quality over quantity? Yeah, quality <laughs> over quantity. We already do that with morphology and motility. So mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. Um, anyway, that was a nice little rabbit trail. Yeah, so near to the sperm, uh, in the general anatomic region, we have the prostate. And uh, prostate cancer patients, um, actually this study was kind of prompted by the DAST survey, uh, Dutasteride Active Surveillance Survey, mm -hmm. um, or study. And there's one going on now called the MAST survey, which is using metformin in a similar way, I think three years. So who would have thought MAST for prostate health? Masterone for prostate health. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that one. Um, but uh, no, it's definitely a reasonable addition in a lot of cancer diagnoses with prostate cancer. Um, you think about uh, anti-androgen effects classically. You think about inhibiting both the gonadal um, steroid synthesis. You think about blocking the androgen receptor. You think about inhibiting adrenal steroidogenesis, but um, inhibiting cell turnover at the end of the day, um, mTOR is an oncogene. Yeah, and it's interesting because it, you know, it has this use in renal cell carcinoma you know, very commonly. I'm not sure if there's a indication for that, but it's mm -hmm. very commonly given. Yep. In extended survival, you know, there's some hyper-responders that are going to live a very long time, much longer than they would have mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, and the renal cancers tend to be kind of you know, encapsulated or not terribly aggressive. Uh, same thing with the prostate cancer, right? That's kind of a similar characteristic. Yep. So um, it, it wasn't a home run. It didn't reverse prostate cancer. It didn't cure the prostate cancer. 
but it did have a potentially favorable impact on the immune system. So uh, T cells uh, were not as exhausted as they were in the placebo group. So, you know, it was a potential favorable signal. Uh, and this was with, you know, once weekly dosing at very, very low doses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, reassuringly there, there certainly wasn't evidence of immune impairment, yeah. which is what you would be concerned for. Yeah, it is a little counterintuitive. And we were looking into this uh, as extensively as we could, looking into the potential immunosuppressive side effects of rapamycin, because you think organ rejection drug, you're concerned for pneumonias and uh, various other infections and getting sepsis easily. And it doesn't really appear to be the case, perhaps partly because it's an immunomodulatory effect. And even just the effect itself on DNA, is, that is a significant contributor to a well-functioning immune system. Yeah. And when we're looking at other public health problems, you know, we talked about sort of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and we're looking at fertility, again, another very common issue. What about mental health? Everybody's talking about ketamine now and ketamine infusions, but mm -hmm. nobody's talking about ketamine plus rapamycin, even though yeah. there is a, I don't know where this idea came from, but there's a study looking at exactly this. Yeah, one of my patients actually sent this to me, and it was uh, actually a very well, um, I guess, well-published study. I'm glad they published it mm -hmm. because their hypothesis was that um, rapamycin before ketamine could alter the effects to where it would not be as effective. Where they found the opposite, they found that it increased the duration of its antidepressant anxiety, it, it, its mental health benefits of the ketamine assisted therapy um, lasted significantly longer. Yeah, which is interesting. And I know they talked about mTORC1, mTORC2, and, and blocking those specifically, uh, we're going to sort of dampen or eliminate that beneficial effect of the ketamine. Yeah. I don't know if they were thinking of, because I'm just speculating here, the BDNF as a growth factor, and then that yeah. growth factor acting on the mTOR pathway. Like it could be totally out in left field, but um, you know, Props to them for publishing their you know, hypothesis that was, or publishing the finding that was counter to their hypothesis. Um, and then also having a placebo group there, because we know in antidepressant studies, the placebo group is incredibly, uh, or that effect is incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, their protocol was rapamycin, six MIGs, or placebo two hours before ketamine infusion. All right. Uh, and then cosmetically, uh, you mentioned cosmetic aging. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people want to continue to look good and feel good. Um, look, you know, turn back the clock a little bit as far as cosmetics. Uh, rapamycin skin cream, um, which isn't terribly impressive to me because you can put a lot of things on your skin and get these exact same results. So the results were uh, decrease in fine wrinkles, increase in dermal volume, reduce skin sagging in a brighter, more even skin tone. And this was specifically on the hands. So this wasn't you know, applied to the face. Um, there are pharmacies who you know, manufacture this and could compound the rapamycin. But again, uh, it's a small positive mm -hmm. effect. Um, we know that the skin you know, is going to lose. It's going to sort of get that same shift into excess mTOR signaling, just like other tissues of the body. So it makes yeah. sense. You can use a localized effect and get a positive outcome. Good candidates for this would be um, individuals that are not just looking for the um, you know, the optimization effects, but if you tend to form benign tumors, perhaps hemangiomas, uh, folliculomas, um, it, uh, possibly even like dermal nevi, anything that has um, excess growth signaling that it's related to, tuberous sclerosis, I believe is um, a potential good match for rapamycin, not just topical in that case. Um, so thinking something like even keloids after a surgery, using a cream like that as an mm -hmm. adjunct, I guess you wouldn't want to have so much mTOR blockage that you impair wound healing, yeah. but just enough to prevent that hypertrophic scar. Yeah. Slow, benign uh, dermal growths. All right. And then here is the interventions testing program. Um, this is a graph we can actually put up because one of the nice things about the interventions testing program, which has, I believe, studied four drugs now, or four substances mm -hmm. that will increase longevity in 
mice of different genetic backgrounds. So it's very easy to show an effect in one specific type of mouse um, because they typically have one specific target in disease that causes mm -hmm. their death. Yeah. Um, in this case, you have these different types of mice and at different centers. So it's not like one center and it can't be reproduced. It's being reproduced at two, two other places at the same time. And you see, you know, a minimum increase of 4% in lifespan. And that was in one group of male mice. And the highest effect here is a 17% increase. Uh, and that was in a group of female mice with the average being 9% you know, for males and then 14% for females. So this yeah. kind of balances out the A carbose, right? Well, the A carbose was only helpful for males, hmm. not helpful for females. And now we have rapamycin that seems to be more helpful for females compared to males. Yeah, it is quite interesting. It's also interesting to look through the data and see the average lifespan for controls and the average lifespan for the intervention group with rapamycin. And at different sites, I wonder what city had the mice that lived the shortest lifespans. Yeah, University of Texas. Um, so is that in Austin? I'm not sure where that is. I think it's in Austin. I wonder if that is a, a consequence of the city, uh, the background pollution there, hmm. or if they just didn't take as good of care of their mice. Yeah, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> All right. Oh, and here's the data about the, the TAME trial. So uh, for those interested, there's a lot of reading and resources you can go to and look at this. But the basic mm -hmm. outline is 3,000 older adults age 65 to 79, and they're going to be given 1,500 milligrams of extended release metformin for six years. So pretty good follow-up time frame for a study like this. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the outcomes, you know, are these people actually going to be healthier or less diseased at the end of the study time mm -hmm. period? Um, so if we did rapamycin in this study instead, what would the protocol look like? So they did 1,500 of metformin extended release. What do we do? Weekly rapamycin, every two weeks rapamycin. Um, and I don't think we've talked about peak and trough levels yet. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing. Probably what we do differently is making sure that we are having our patients for sure clear the rapamycin from their system prior to that next dose. Because even in the literature, you'll see that it's really variable how long this sticks around, how high the peak level of the serolimus rapamycin is. So mm -hmm. in our patients, we always want to make sure that that level is essentially undetectable yep. at the, the washout period. So they're day seven or day 10, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. And then there's you know a lot of opinions out there about like what a good peak level is. It seems like the abundance of the data has sort of landed around this, you know, six milligram mark. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be what people most commonly self-report taking from these surveys. Uh, but for some people, six milligrams couldn't could put them too high. For some nope. people, it wouldn't clear out. For other people, six milligrams is not going to get them, you know, above level of ten, I believe, nanogram per milliliter. Yeah. And uh, one thing to note in younger ages, for example, 20 through 40, your peak is probably going to be around 45 minutes, very fast. Your area under the curve might be the same, but you'll probably have a higher peak and um, it will also wash out faster. So very common to see extremely low trough levels, which is good. In um, older age categories, for example, if we repeated the TAME trial, 65 to 79, um, the peak might not happen for 90 minutes or even two hours in uh, an 80 year old. And then your area under the curve would be fairly large, um, delayed gastric transit, delayed uptake. Um, so just, I think of it as like sl sluggish pharmacokinetics, if you will, um, even with the same pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics, as you mentioned, um, is affected. That's just um, what gene you happen to have that metabolizes whatever drug it's metabolizing. And um, then over time, the activity of various things like uptake can also play a role. Yeah. And the healthy volunteer dosing study where you kind of look at, they dose based on body surface area, anywhere from a you know, sort of sub one milligram dose, I believe, all the way up to like 16, 17 milligrams. If we're assuming a person about 180 pounds, um, pretty substantial dosing. And they had peak levels that are much exceeding what we see in our practice and our patients, but these are also 
you know, young men who are you know, 18 to early 20s, and all of them are peaking within an hour. Yep. And even though we don't necessarily have that data, um, I think the encapsulated rapamycin for prostate cancer did have some pharmacokinetic data there. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me like you don't really need an encapsulated form because we're seeing it behave in a very similar way, you know, about a 90 minute peak time in individuals, you know, let's just say 40 plus, that, that seems to be the pattern that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, another note is th sometimes we're asked about its cousin, Everolimus, which I don't believe is generic yet. So that's probably one reason why its use is not as common, but there is some evidence and there are some studies that there could be use cases that are better to use Everolimus over um, Rapamycin, which is Serolimus. Yeah, I believe it does have a slightly shorter half-life. Mm -hmm. And that was also the Rapalog that was used in the immunization study that you yep. referenced at the beginning. So, Correct. W which I believe was in um, a geriatric patient population. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It made their immune response more similar to a younger patient cohort. Makes which, a lot of sense. They have slowed peak um, and you're worried about a trough later. So you use something with a higher peak and less trough. Yeah. It was a particularly well-known study and we'll put a link to that in our description. Um, another thing people ask about is, you know, well, rapamycin can be expensive depending on the dose that you're on, yep. uh, depending on your blood levels, depending on if you have a clinic that measures your blood levels. Um, what about compounded rapamycin? And this was interesting. I, I don't have a lot of experience with this because I haven't prescribed compounded metformin in uh, like capsules for patients, but I did see a thread on Twitter where an individual uh, was taking their compounded rapamycin went and got a blood level, and the blood level was zero. Ooh, not great. Um, I, any compounded medication, I would be somewhat skeptical of. Um, we've said on the podcast before, we're, uh, we're not hiding it. There are certain compounding pharmacies that we never use just because of what we see. And there are certain compounding pharmacies that are of very high quality. Um, so if you'd like to find out, then become a Gillette health patient and we, <laughs> and we will do that. Um, but obviously we don't officially endorse any pharmacy and I believe we're not, we're really not even allowed to do that. Yeah. But we, we do like to verify. So, you know, you're, check. you're using something that is of, you know, variable quality. You know, it is the majority of the time that what something that comes out of a compounding pharmacy is the legitimate product yep. at the legitimate dose. Um, but it's just not as tight of quality control as you would see in a large pharmaceutical company. And even large pharmaceutical companies aren't perfect. I believe it was what Torvastatin that had some glass shards in it mm -hmm. not too terribly long ago. Yeah. So things then, can go wrong yep. uh, regardless of the situation. Yep. Zantax had some stuff in it as well. So Yeah. I remember when that got pulled from the shelves. Um, blood pressure medication probably in the 2019 mm. 2020 era i think there was a mm. blood pressure med that um, got pulled so these things do happen even in a you know large pharmaceutical company and, and certainly we've seen those happen mm. in uh, compounding pharmacies as well we've briefly touched on side effects we mentioned theoretical immunosuppression but also um, theoretical and some decent evidence for cases of immunomodulation um, so immune boosting effect if you will um, what are some of the other things that we see pretty commonly? Yeah, so probably the most common, at least in the rapamycin taking community, mm -hmm. are these canker sores or mucosal injury. And that's probably not limited just to the you know oral cavity. It's probably mm -hmm. throughout the GI tract. These cells that are turning over very rapidly are going to be more susceptible to having the rate of turnover reduced. So just yeah. like uh, you know, chemotherapy patients will get this stomatitis and GI upset and these sorts of things. You could, in theory, see a similar thing. Um, so we do make it a practice to have our patients prescribe dibacterol if they are on the rapamycin because having a painful ulcer in your mouth uh, is not good for your quality of life. Uh, it probably won't affect your health span, but you'll be uncomfortable for a couple of days to a week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say those are the biggest ones. And then that potential I put down there just because, you know, male infertility and thinking if I am in a point in my life where I'm going to conceive, you know, whether I'm a man or a woman, mm -hmm. I probably don't want the brakes on mTOR um, going into that. There's yep. too, too many unknowns. So um, that'd be a situation to not use it. Uh, anyone who is still developing, yeah, that would be a situation to not use it. Certainly. So... Um, other contraindications would be a 
hypersensitivity or skin reaction. People can have allergies to these drugs. Um, mm -hmm. It's not for everyone, just like with any medication, antibiotics or what have you. Yeah, we're not quite ready to put anything in the water, <laughs> not even omegas. But um, one thing that we thought was uh, a fun find is in one of the studies, there was a placebo group and one of the individuals that um, was taking placebo rapamycin developed uh, aptus ulcers, the stomatitis. So they must have read the package insert. And when that happened, they were like, oh, for sure, I'm in the intervention group. I you got know, the real stuff. They were on the placebo. So Come to find out, they were taking a placebo. Yep. Um, I think that about sums it up for today. Yeah, I think it's a good start. We tried to give a pretty broad overview, and it, it's nice to see reassuring results all the way from yeast to cats to dogs to you know, human studies that don't show harm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the safety profile, and we'll be following these studies as they come out. Um, but if there's any questions or anything that we need to address, and we'll certainly have a part two at some point, then please leave those things in the comments. Let us know your rapamycin protocol, if you've had your blood levels measured, mm -hmm. and anything else in the aging context you have questions about. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And may God give you health and happiness.